So good afternoon, everybody. At the outset, I'd like to thank the Department of Medicine for having invited me to share my thoughts on the management of acute pancreatitis, where we, we will be looking at some basic principles and approach of handling this entity. So this shall be the outline of our talk. It's divided into three parts, an introduction, and then management the initial one or two weeks, and the subsequent management. Our focus would be on the management in the first one and two weeks. Now we know acute pancreatitis refers to the acute inflammation of the pancreas characterized by local injury can go on to develop SIRS and organ failure. It's a leading cause of IP admissions among GI conditions. The American statistics show that about 2.75 lakh patients get hospitalized every year. The cost is 2.6 billion per year. The incidence is 5 to 30 per 100,000, and the case fatality rate is approximately 5%. Now, what is the Indian data on this? There was this paper which came in the Indian Journal of Gastroenterology in 2018, where they looked at the burden of GI and liver diseases in India, both infectious and non-infectious. If you closely study that particular paper, you would see that of all the conditions that have been described, the greatest change in terms of prevalence, mortality, and DALI, the disability adjusted life years, on comparing the two years, 1990 and 2016, the largest change was in terms of pancreatitis compared to any other disease. That shows how significant this problem uh, is there in any setup in India. Coming to the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, it is based on the fulfillment of two out of three criteria of abdominal pain, which is acute, epigastric, severe, radiating to the back, the pancreatic enzymes being at least uh, three times the upper limit of normal, and you have the characteristic findings on abdominal imaging. The serum amylase will rise in about a few hours of onset, and it normalizes in three to five days. It's normal in 20% of patients with acute pancreatitis, the causes being mild pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, and hypertriglyceridemia. False positive can occur in bowel perforation, renal failure, and non-pancreatic diseases, such as of the salivary gland and fallopian tubes. In comparison to serum amylase, the lipase, uh, it is more specific. It remains uh, re elevated for a longer period, and the false positive conditions are more or less similar. Somebody coming with acute pancreatitis, one of the common investigations is a transabdominal ultrasound abdomen. Very useful when there is a biliary cause for pancreatitis, where we're looking for biliary dilatation, stones in the gallbladder, stones in the bile duct. You might see ascites and the pancreas to be enlarged and hypoechoic, which may be diffuse or focal. The limiting factors are that bowel gas obscures the visualization, and this is also operator dependent. A routine CECT, contrast enhanced CT abdomen, is not warranted. The CECT or MRI is only when the diagnosis is unclear or there's failure to improve clinically within the first 48 to 72 hours after admission. The advantages of MRI are we can do an MRCP to see for CBD stones and pancreatic duct disruption. We can assess for necrosis in patients with contrast allergy and renal failure by doing a T2-weighted imaging without gadolinium. I've just listed some of the common causes of acute pancreatitis that we encounter in our wards. The foremost being alcohol, closely followed by gallstones, others being post-CRCP, hypertriglyceridemia, hypercalcemia, tumors, drugs such as azathioprine, trauma, and others. Now, this is an important slide which talks about the natural history of acute pancreatitis. There are two phases, an early phase and a late phase. Early phase characterized by SIRS, where there's a lot of inflammatory cytokines that can cause organ failure. After two weeks, again, there's another chance for organ failure when there is infection of the uh, necrotic material leading to sepsis and septicemia. The revised Atlanta classification classifies pancreatitis into three categories, mild, moderately severe, and severe. Mild is the absence of organ failure and local complications, moderately severe, refers to the presence of local complications like collections, 
with or without a transient organ failure, which will settle in less than 48 hours. In persistent organ failure, if it exists, that is lasting more than 48 hours, then you would call those set of patients as having severe pancreatitis. Now, you would use the modified scoring system to say that whether there is organ dysfunction, we look at the respiratory, renal, and cardiovascular systems, and any score of two or beyond would say that that system is involved, meaning if it, uh, you're dealing with something more than a mild pancreatitis. This slide shows the mortality in acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis, 80% are mild, 20% have moderate or severe pancreatitis. For those who have mild, about the mortality is about 1%. For those who have moderate or severe, about two-thirds will have sterile necrosis. The mortality is 13%. One-third will have infected necrosis. The mortality is 15 to 35%. Coming to the core of our talk, that is the initial management or the management in the first two weeks, there needs to be an initial assessment and risk stratification. We need to start resuscitate. Uh, we need to assess hemodynamic status on presentation, start resuscitative measures as needed. The risk assessment are divided into low and high risk categories. Those who are high risk, they will end up with more problems. They need to be managed in HDU or an ICU. And this helps us to prognosticate. The prediction of severity. There are multiple scoring systems with cutoffs we are all aware of since our MBBS days. The Ransom score more than three and Apache two more than eight and several such scores. What are they used? About 50% will be found to have, predicted to have severe pancreatitis based on those cutoffs. Of these only 50 will develop, 50% will develop moderate or severe pancreatitis. None who have a predicted mild disease will develop moderate or severe pancreatitis. Hence the utility is to exclude the possibility of developing severe disease. And the accuracy is more or less comparable across the various systems. Just a slide to show how certain parameters can predict a severe course in terms of patient characteristics, SIRS, lab findings, and radiological findings. We come to the next part of this management. Very crucial is the management of pain, which is the predominant symptom the treatment should be prompt, adequate. There is no particular analgesic strategy that is superior. Frequent assessment of pain scores is useful, and you treat according to the local pain protocol. NSAs like diclofenac can be used. Opiates are preferred. We use tramadol. If the pain is severe, we may go up to morphine. Newer concepts in the management of pain would be the thoracic epidural anesthesia and the patient-controlled analgesia pump. The next part would be fluid management. We know that there is a lot of fluid loss when there is vomiting, decreased oral intake, third space loss, respiratory loss, sweating. There used to be a concept of goal-directed therapy where you give about 5 to 10 ml per kilogram of per hour of IV fluids initially, looking for the attainment of one of the goals that have been listed. But then, as has been with other areas, goal-directed therapy has been found to have no specific advantage over the standard therapy. What do you assess when you do fluid assessment? Clinical parameters, heart rate, blood pressure, urine output, blood tests like PCV, invasive items like CVP, which is unreliable, intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring. Uh, it's a little bit invasive, but we could look for non-invasive measures like using the ultrasound Look for the IVC diameter, it's underfilled, overfilled, and again using the cable index and the lung for the presence of B lines. A rapid fluid collection, correction can lead to poor outcomes. What type of fluid can we use? Normal saline or ringer lactate? Ringer lactate can de decrease the pancreatic acidosis and decrease the trypsin activity. RCTs have shown that the SIRS and the CRP have reduced, but a very Recent RCT has shown that um, the main difference has been in the decreased admission to the ICU. There is no role for hydroxyethyl starch. So let me just summarize the fluid management. It is critical in the first 72 hours. Three to four liters of ringer lactate in 24 hours. Caution with elderly comorbidities, renal failure, and intra-abdominal hypertension. You reassess uh, every six to eight hours, preferably non-invasively. 
more than 72 hours, the fluid input is based on the fluid output. Is there a role for prophylactic antibiotics? The AGI guidelines in 2018 showed that you should not be using a routine prophylactic antibiotics for anybody who is coming with severe pancreatitis. However, antibiotics can be given when there is an extra pancreatic infection such as cholangitis, urinary tract infection, and pneumonia. Nutritional support. Early versus delayed feeding. The initial concept was go for uh, bowel rest, but uh, that's the rest of the pancreas. But later, the idea has been to give early feeding. When you compare the two, when you have, there's no difference in mortality, but then when you do a delayed feeding, there's an increased risk for interventions for necrosis and trends for infected necrosis and multi-organ failure. The guidelines talk about giving food uh, oral feeding as tolerated and keeping the patient nil per hour as early as 24 hours. So low fat oral diet as tolerated gradual increment, early feeding may be need to be delayed if pain, vomiting or ileus. Parenteral versus enteral. The enteral group has decreased risk for infective necrosis, single organ failure or multi-organ failure. TPN only when the enteral root is not possible, unable to meet the minimum caloric requirements. There's no difference between nasogastric or nasogestinal feeding in terms of various outcome measures. ERCP in acute pancreatitis, it should be an urgent ERCP, less than 24 hours when there is cholangitis. Urgent, I mean, early ERCP reasonable if there is persistent biliary obstruction without cholangitis. Other indications are biliary ascariasis and biliary hydatidosis. In ERCP, you would go for biliary sphincterotomy with or without biliary stenting. Uh, we may need to do a prior MRCP or EUS to assess the biliary obstruction and need for ERCP. Timing of cholecystectomy in acute biliary pancreatitis, the early surgery group, there's a decreased risk for recurrent biliary events. In delayed surgery, there's decreased inflammation, safer and better outcomes. And RCT comparing the two approaches had shown that early surgery had decreased in composite outcome of mortality, gallstone complications, readmission for recurrent pancreatitis, and pancreatobiliary complications. So the AGA guideline is that in the same admission, if prefer, to have the cholecystectomy happening. Alcohol counseling during admission for alcohol-related pancreatitis. A Cochrane review had shown that when you used alcohol reduction strategies in primary care, when you do a brief intervention, there's a decreased consumption compared to the control group. In the RCT, an RCT has shown that when you compare repeated intervention at six-month intervals versus single intervention, the benefit is for the former with a stronger trend towards decreased hospital admission rates. So when people get admitted with acute alcoholic pancreatitis, the AGA recommends a brief alcoholic intervention during admission before discharge. Let's look at the subsequent management. That is the third part of the talk, which is, uh, again, we come to this slide, which shows that in the late phase, that the chances of organ failure is when there is infection and sepsis. What is pancreatic necrosis? It refers to the non-viable pancreatic parenchyma. The involvement can be pancreatic, peripancreatic, or predominantly it is a combination of the two. This is just a slide which actually shows a CT on the left side with a lot of non-viable tissue. And on the right, a T2-weighted MRI, which is, shows a quite messed up pancreas with fluid and necrotic material. This slide is an important slide which talks about the four types of collections that can develop as a consequence of pancreatitis. Uh, the ones on the top, the acute fluid collection, the acute necrotic collection, they occur less than four weeks. There is no recognizable wall. While those which are more than four weeks, the pancreatic pseudocyst and the wall of necrosis, there's a well-defined wall. And this is as time passes, it becomes more organized and then that's the best time to do interventions. The, the difference between the collections on the left and the right are the presence of necrotic tissue for those on the right. Infected pancreatic necrosis, it's a suspicion when there is evidence of sepsis, a fever more than 38, persistent SIRS, failure to improve or there's a deterioration in the clinical condition, an extra luminal gas in the peripancreatic tissues on CT, and the diagnosis is made 
on gram stain or culture positivity for bacteria and or fungi by tissue sampling by usually doing a CT guided. But this is not always necessary. The only advantage is sometimes when you get material, uh, well, you can do culture and you can do sensitivity and that can help us to govern antibiotic usage. There is no benefit for routine antibiotic and antifungal prophylaxis when there is suspected or proven infected necrosis, <clears throat> antibiotics targeting the gut-derived bacteria and adapted to culture and sensitivity should be used. We look for antibiotics that penetrate into the pancreas, like carbapenems, quinolones, metrodazole, hydrocephalosporins. There's no data on the adequate duration. It can be as short as two to as long as six to eight weeks. 14% are found to improve with just antibiotics alone. What is the role of nutrition? Enteral feeding should be initiated early. It decreases the risk of infected necrosis. Uh, we know very well that the bowel, when it is healthy and intact, there's less chance for bacterial translocation. And as a result, the chance of infection reduces. So we would start with oral nutrition. If this is not feasible, go to nasogastric or nasogestional tube feeding. If there is prolonged tube feeding requ required, we may have to do a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy with or without jejunal extension. And this is determined whether there is gastroparesis or not. If there is no gastroparesis, PEG should be fine. If there is gastroparesis, you can go for a PEG-G. And finally, if nothing works, we have to probably resort to total parental nutrition. Just a picture showing the different interventions, invasive interventions that can be done when someone comes with pancreatic necrosis as uh, we have radiologic, endoscopic, or surgical. The indications for interventions when there's proven or sus clinically suspected pancreatic necrosis, there is ongoing organ failure or failure to thrive, organ compression, such as gastric outer obstruction, intestinal or biliary obstruction, and pain due to mass effect, or an anterior compartment syndrome. What are the principles of interventions? We generally aim for drainage with or without debridement, we go for endotherapy, percutaneous therapy, surgery, which is minimally invasive or invasive, and a combination of all this. You avoid interventions if possible in the early phase. Optimally, it is delayed till four weeks when the collection becomes more organized and more amenable to interventions. Step up approach, start with a first line non-surgical approach, percutaneous or endoscopic therapy. And endotherapy is preferred over percutaneous because there's a risk, less risk for pancreatic or cutaneous fistula. Now, when do you go for endotherapy for uh, pancreatic collections? Um, when the collections are most centrally located, adjoining a stomach or duodenum, uh, very, very easy for doing endotherapy. We would use either metal stents or plastic stents, and that helps in drainage. Uh, percutaneous interventions are used when there are peripheral collections, when there are infected or symptomatic collections in the early phase, less than two weeks, for those who are too ill to undergo endotherapy or surgery, as an adjunct to endotherapy for Waldorf necrosis, with deep extension into the paracolic gutters or pelvis, and as a salvage therapy when um, for the necrotic burden, which persists despite prior therapy. Just a cartoon showing what happens during transmural endoscopic drainage, transmural across the wall. So you take your scope into the stomach, make a hole in the stomach into the collection, which is located posteriorly, put stents. There's also an irrigating catheter you see, and this helps to flush out the, uh, the infected material. Well, when you put a metal stent, you have more uh, larger diameter to enter into the cyst and to clean up. And on the right, what you see is what happens at the end of cleanup. We see healthy granulation tissue. The surgical options may be what we see over here on the right, uh, minimally invasive, where there is, through the tract of the CT guided drain, it is opened out, a videoscope and forceps are used to debride, it's called videoscopic assisted retroperitoneal debridement, and laparoscopic or open transgastric debridement. That is, you enter the stomach, and from the endoscope again, target the posterior wall to enter the collection and debride. I want to talk about something called as a disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. That is because of severe degree of damage. The continuity of the pancreatic duct is lost. So what will happen is all the secretions will start pouring out 
uh, in the adjoining and there's a persistent collection. And if you do an ERCP, we see that the full, uh, the, the pancreatic, pancreatogram stops short somewhere here. It doesn't proceed further and all the contrast gets accumulated there. So that is called the disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome, but the treatment is generally surgical. Either you resect or you do a pancreatic jejunostomy. Uh, sometimes we do through ERCP or transpapillary or transmural stending, but we have to keep the stent for a longer, piece, longer period of time. There may be some benefit with that approach. Pancreatic fistula, which is refers to the leakage of pancreatic juice, may be either internal or external. Internal, it can lead to ascites, pleural effusion, or communication of the bubble. External, uh, through drains and wounds, it comes outside. The treatment would be drainage through paracentesis, thoracocentesis. You can use octreotide to reduce the out, uh, output. Uh, if the disruption of the pancreatic duct is partial and the collection less than five centimeter size, you can use a transpapillary stent. And the surgical option would be to resection or to do a pancreatic jejunostomy. Let me talk about few other complications. If the attack of pancreas is so severe, there can be a severe degree of um, quite a bit of damage to the parenchyma and can lead to exocrine insufficiency. And for that, you need to probably give pancreatic enzyme supplements. There may be endocrine insufficiency for which you need to give anti-diabetic therapy. And then there can be splanchnic vein thrombosis. That's a little tricky situation whether a clinician has to take the call whether to anticoagulate or not. And then there's an entity called pseudoaneurysm, the picture of which has been shown here. Uh, what happens is a pseudocyst converts into uh, an aneurysm because it erodes into the adjoining vessel, the commonest artery being the splenic artery. And that from a fluid collection, it becomes a blood filled collection. And the treatment is generally led by the intervention radiologist. There are some few endoscopic uh, therapies described, but if all this fails, we have surgeons to look up to for help. Uh, the last complication is abdominal compartment syndrome. It refers to when the intra-abdominal pressure is more than 20 millimeters of mercury in a sustained manner with new onset organ failure. The treatment options would be medical therapy, nasogastric or rectal decompression, and invasive therapy, that is the drainage of ascites, uh, laparostomy, and fasciotomy. So let me just recap what we just went through in the last few minutes. We looked at two parts. One is an initial management of acute pancreatitis, where we talked about the importance of predicting the severity. And then we talked about giving analgesics, which should be adequate and prompt. We talked about fluid management. That's about three to four liters in the first 24 hours of renal lactate. And you monitor every three, six to eight hours. And then prophylactic antibiotics as a routine has no role. Nutrition, very important. It has to be early feeding, enteral, and then the role of urgent ERCP when there is cholangitis. The timing of cholecystectomy for acute biliary pancreatitis is preferably in the same admission. And for anybody who comes with alcoholic pancreatitis, it's important that we give a counseling session at the time of admission, and preferably these patients should be followed up uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming months. And last, we looked at the subsequent management, that is the management beyond the first two weeks, where the importance was to, um, was, was to talk about continuing antibiotics uh, if required, and when there's a suspicion of, uh, of sepsis. And nutrition, again, we would start again with oral, enteral, and then if long-term is required, PEG or PEG-J, and finally, uh, TPN. And we talked about the management of pancreatic necrosis, again, either endoscopic, percutaneous, or surgical in a step-up graded manner. And the more you wait, the better the chance of uh, success. And we also lastly looked at uh, some of the other uh, complications, which are small, but they are quite significant. Uh, I think with this, I would like to just wind up my lecture. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, sir. I think that was a very brief and very relevant, uh, clearly stated uh, approach to acute pancreatitis. Any questions, please type in the chat box. So, uh, with respect to imaging, uh, 
on a diagnostic on a follow up basis do we recommend ct on every okay um, see um, as i just said ct as a routine is not required it's actually required only when uh, when the diagnosis is not sure sometimes you know when you have a elevated amylase it's not only due to pancreatitis it can sometimes be due to bowel perforation and that is something which we need to address and when you're not sure of that yes you may go for the ct otherwise after 20 i mean after 48 to 72 hours if patients don't improve i guess uh, there is a role for going ahead with ct we don't keep doing it just like that uh, we have to understand is there a benefit by doing this for any modality we always look at three things is there a benefit what are the disadvantages what are the costs and something is beneficial yes go ahead and do it but not as something to be done on a weekly basis as such uh, yes a question uh, mr charko uh, sir does any of the drugs like morphine uh, used in pain management increases pancreatitis uh, they do talk about morphine sometimes um, being counterproductive they say it increases the sphincter of ordi uh, it it causes more contraction but remember we use it only when patients have very severe pain in most of our patients with tramadol they settle uh, and then when you really when you really need it you would go for something like morphine in between you also have patches which can be also utilized so uh, very rarely we go for morphine but i think the patient is in distress we should uh, address that at the same time we should find out what else is driving that pain is there something else which we are missing rather than just treating symptomatically thank you sir any further questions uh with respect to supplements pancreatic supplements how uh, uh the more different types of supplements are. okay so actually what i was trying to say is uh, in acute pancreatitis sometimes when the degree of necrosis is so vast and there's a significant degree of damage there isn't much parenchyma left so it will behave something like a form of a chronic pancreatitis that happens rarely but if that happens uh, you would assess that sometimes the patient may talk about having steatorrhea when they eat oily food uh, when you do a serum when you do a stool elastase that can be low and when you suspect that then you would give different pancreatic enzyme supplements as part of management It's just like how we do for chronic pancreatitis and how how, how much of a resolution in terms of active pancreatitis and how often they change progress to chronic oh i i think it would be less i think if you saw um, one of those earlier slides you would see that a large good percentage would actually resolve and it's about um, a minority which actually goes on to develop uh, severe or moderate or severe pancreatitis and i would say that going into chronic pancreatitis maybe should be uh, less than 5% or so it all depends on how much of degree of damage has happened initially Any further questions? We'll uh, soon be uploading this lecture in our Department of Medicine YouTube website. Uh, if any queries that we need to further to be addressed, please uh, mail to uh, med to SCMC value dot ac dot i. Thanks again, sir. I think uh, we were actually very grateful to have you, Edson, uh, to have taken this lecture for us. And he's he someone who's very approachable and also uh, someone who we are actually look up to in terms of as a teacher. And uh, thanks again, sir, for this lecture. Uh, any uh, doubts? Please feel free to ask sir in person, or we can mail to us. So we'll wind up for today. Thank you, Edson. Thank you, sir.